This week on The Record, former President Donald Trump is a convicted felon. A jury of his peers finding Trump guilty on 34 counts in a criminal conspiracy to affect the outcome of the 2016 election. I'm a very innocent man. The sentencing, scheduled for July 11, could put a major party presidential nominee behind bars during the Republican National Convention. Legal expert Andrews Walker is on The Record. A rematch in the race for mayor, St. Louis City Alderwoman Kara Spencer is on the record. Can she win this time? What would she change at City Hall? A wide-ranging interview with the Alderwoman just ahead. Plus, the race for Congress heating up in St. Louis. Will Cori Bush debate her Democratic challenger, Wesley Bell? It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. For the first time in American history, a former president is now a convicted felon. A jury deliberated nine hours before all 12 members agreed with government prosecutors who argued Mr. Trump falsified business records to conceal hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels, all in a scheme to influence New York voters in the 2016 presidential election. We turn right to legal analyst and constitutional expert, SLU Law Professor Andrews Walker. Good to have you with us. Uh, Mr. Trump's sentencing is July 11. That's four days before the Republican National Convention. Uh, the judge could sentence Trump to probation, not jail time, and they plan to appeal. Given all those dynamics, what are the chances Trump is actually behind bars before the nominating convention? Worst case scenario, the judge sentences Trump to prison and he's elected. I said jail, not prison. And he's elected. And he's elected. He could be in jail before the election. Before the election. Then, okay, so walk us, I know we're getting into hypothetical territory here, but can a president pardon himself? As of now, only for federal offenses. This is a state crime. However, the U.S. Supreme Court will probably read that loosely and allow him to pardon himself. That's your prediction. Uh, on the state crime and this current conviction, there was some attention, a lot of attention paid to the judge's instructions to the jury. Some right-wing media, I think, used irresponsible language to mislead audiences saying that the jury didn't have to agree on the charges. They did. They had to agree on falsifying business records and they had to agree that Mr. Trump concealed those records to influence the election, but the judge says they didn't have to all agree on which illegal means Trump and Cohen used to actually do that. How much scrutiny will those jury instructions face on appeal? So a uh, mistake in jury instructions could throw out the entire case. So it is possible that this will be overturned uh, on the law if the judge made a mistake. Uh, the charges, in my view, were very vague. Vague. Why is that? Well, falsifying business records is a misdemeanor. It's no offense. Uh, President Trump said that these are for legal services rendered. Well, Michael Cohen was performing legal services for President Trump. I don't see how that In is In the pursuit so of criminal. concealing information from voters. Correct. However, paying someone not to talk is not in and of itself a crime. Uh, you can pay me not to talk and I'll stop talking <laughs> right now. Uh, we, we like uh, when you talk to us. How would you grade the Trump legal defense strategy? I'm a little surprised they didn't put him on the stand. Really? He's a compelling speaker. He's a dynamic personality. Uh, that could have humanized the trial. My guess is Trump's supporters are not going to be phased by this. Um, I was surprised he was not on the stand, however. His supporters. Very interesting. Uh, Andrews Walker, uh, legal analyst and SLU law professor, thank you for joining us. Thank you. When we come back, St. Louis mayoral candidate Kara Spencer is with us. Stick around. Three years ago, St. Louis voters elected a black woman mayor for the first time in the city's 257-year history. Former treasurer and state representative Tashara Jones won that primary and the runoff election. But in both races, Alderwoman Kara Spencer finished second, at first trailing by 4,729 votes. In that runoff, Spencer came even closer, within 2,300 votes, 52 to 48 percent. Now she's back and challenging the first-term incumbent. Kara Spencer is on the record. Good to have you with us. Good to be back. Are you running against Mayor Jones's record or on your own? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I'm running on my own record, um, but you know, I think we have got a lot of challenges here um, and we really haven't been hitting the mark. Hitting the mark in what sense? And getting things done. I mean, there were a lot of campaign promises uh, in the last round, making our 
communities safer, getting our city back on track. And look, we're losing an enormous amount of population every single day. Crime is down, way down. Should she get any credit for that? You know, crime, it, the stats are moving in the right direction. That's a good thing. But the people I talk to on a daily basis don't feel safer. Reckless driving is out of control. And our record on that front is abysmal. We have seen pedestrian fatalities already in, in, at the end of May here uh, that eclipsed last year's entire uh, pedestrian fatality numbers. Totally different uh, race, so the comparison isn't fair. Apples to oranges, right? But voters look at Trump, Biden, rematch. Spencer Jones, rematch. <laughs> so a very different obviously a different race, but people want to know, is this race going to be any different or is it going to sound a lot the same? So is this campaign going to be a rerun, like an I told you so, or are you hoping that voters have buyer's remorse? I think this is going to be a lot different than last round. Look, last round we were running during COVID. I wasn't able to knock doors at all. Um, for me, this race is going to look a lot like bringing people together, being present in communities, knocking on doors, talking to voters, not just about what we need to be doing, but about bringing people in to the solutions that we need to see in our communities. The city just lost a big court battle over its earnings tax. And if this appeals court ruling stands, the city could lose somewhere around $25 million, the mayor's office estimates. Uh, and it may have to pay refunds out to workers who live outside city limits, but rem uh, were working remotely. I know the city earnings tax was popular among city voters, mm -hmm. but non-city voters never got their say and still had to pay. Did the court make the right decision? You know, I'm not going to speak to what the court decided. I will say I am a strong supporter of the earnings tax, um, and here's why. The city of St. Louis carries the burden of being, you know, the, the sort of center of our region. Um, our, we have cultural amenities um, and that the region enjoys. And when folks come down here and work down here, we've got to pay into the system. And quite frankly... Um, but these people didn't come down here. They stayed home. Well, they work in the city of St. Louis. And yes, they were working remotely for part of the time, but another part of the time they're here. So their office is down here. The entity that they work for is in the city of St. Louis, and we still have to provide infrastructure and public safety and police to really make sure that they're safe uh, when they're here, uh, whether they're here every single day or not. Mayors have to make tough calls. On one hand, uh, the city stands to lose a lot of money mm -hmm. if this court decision stands. On the other hand, the city has already spent more than $200,000 on outside lawyers fighting this losing battle. Would you appeal this to the Supreme Court? Uh, I'm not in a position right now to say that. And right now, um, I think, you know. You're not, but you're running for the position that would say that. Okay, that's true that to some extent. So right now, I think, you know, the best, the city of St. Louis, um, I will say, as far as this lawsuit is concerned, I mean, this is a big deal. Um, you know, I think at this point, um, you know, I, you know, without being fully briefed on all the legal aspects of it, and I haven't been, unfortunately, that, in, you know, as, as involved as a mayor would be mm -hmm. in this case, I will say, I think, you know, it, you know, it's probably time to cut ties and kind of, you know, move forward. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a tough decision for the city's budget, which you sit on the budget uh, committee and chair the budget committee, so there, you're close to the issue there, and you might be able to speak to how you know, it affects that, the city's services. The mayor said, it's interesting because in court, the city's lawyers were saying, this is going to drastically affect city services. And the mayor's statement said exactly the opposite. We don't think this is going to affect city services. You know, I'm going to disagree it? on that. You know, with the $26 million that the budget director projected is going to, you know, this particular lawsuit is going to cut in, is it going to be a big deal? I mean, that's 5% of our overall, you know, general budget for the city of St. Louis. That is a big portion of what we spend on providing city services. You know, I will say that I think that we should be fighting tooth and nail for every dollar that we should, you know, that we can bring into the city of St. Louis. The earnings tax makes it a, a full one third of our city's budget. And so any, any threat to that is something we should fight for. But this lawsuit did have standing. We knew that going into it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, the Board of Aldermen has not been in a position to be to be fully knowledgeable about all the components here. We asked the administration, we have asked our collector of revenue who's really running that lawsuit to come and brief us and they have refused and refused and refused. And that's been a problem. Can, you can't drag Greg Daly before the, a, a panel and have him testify? Well, we can, um, but you know, at the same time we are 
you know, trying to play nice, mm -hmm. if you will. Let's move on. One of your main campaign planks is population loss. You mentioned it at the outset of this interview. The city has lost population in every year since the 1950s, except for slight growth in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and 13, right around the middle of the Slay administration. So I look back, and St. Louis voters have elected mayors mm -hmm. who oversaw a declining, shrinking city seven times in That's that true. span of time. Why would this be any different? Because our population loss right now is unprecedented. The rate at which we are losing population as a percentage It's is, not unprecedented. It, it's up there. It is up there. I mean, for, for the last several years, I mean, this we're seeing a steeper decline. We've lost 20,000. Since the 80s. It's probably the worst since roughly the 80s. That's right. Since, since basically I've been alive, uh, you're seeing a precipitous loss 20,000 people since the 2020 census. That's, that's and if you me, trust the census numbers. Okay, but, sure, sure, yeah. sure. But let me say this. It is also in a very targeted part of our city. Which part? It is in, it, the, the population loss is almost exclusively out of North St. Louis. And so you're seeing a very, very targeted loss of population in a very specific geographical area. And I think what you're seeing is people that are looking at the city services, the safety in their neighborhoods, and they're leaving for not just other parts of our region, but other parts of the United States. They're going to Houston, mm -hmm. Dallas, Atlanta, where you're seeing more economic activities, mm -hmm. uh, less racial divide, um, and safer, safer communities. It is an odd turn. For decades, the term had been in white flight. And mm -hmm. in recent years, in big cities, St. Louis among them, it is black uh, city residents that are leaving at a faster rate for one reason or another. Uh, we've seen red state governors in Florida and New York bus migrants to cities like New York and Chicago. They, they haven't done that in St. Louis. There haven't been buses of migrants here. The mayor has welcomed them um, verbally. What role do you think immigration plays in boosting St. Louis's population? And would you invite those governors to send their migrant buses here? Look, I, you know, one of the reasons why the population loss in North St. Louis out of our black and brown communities is so important is because nationally speaking, the white population is stagnant. I mean, you know, there's just not uh, the growth. The birth rate is stagnant. The birth rate, uh, population numbers nationally on, and white mm. populations are very, very flat. So if we want to be a community that sees growth, that is growing, the communities nationally that are, that are growing are, are black and brown communities. So absolutely, I think that uh, making sure that we're keeping our you know, residents here, but growing those populations is one of the only keys really to growing population um, in our city. So, so would you, you? So absolutely, I mean, I think that uh, bringing you know, folks into our communities is a, is a key component of seeing that population growth that can, that can lead to economic prosperity. I've got a lot more questions. You got a little more time? Of course I do. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back. Our conversation continues with Alderwoman Kara Spencer, who's running for mayor a second time against the first term incumbent, Tishara Jones. Do you consider yourself more progressive than Mayor Jones? In some ways, I mean, look, the word progressive has so many meanings, and I don't even know what it means anymore. Um, but certainly, um, I do not believe in continuing the status quo. Um, I don't believe we should just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And so for that, uh, I consider myself a progressive, absolutely. Voters now get a chance to assess her first four years, three years now, four years by the time the uh, election comes around, uh, of her record. Mm -hmm. Would you fire the city jail commissioner? Um, you know, I have some very strong concerns about her performance. And given what I know right now, I am not comfortable uh, continuing under her leadership. So you'd like, that sounds like a maybe yes. Am uh, I reading you correctly? You know, you know, in our budget committee hearings in the last week, yeah, I mean, I think there are some real serious concerns about what's going on there. There's a lack of transparency that I am very, very concerned about. Um, and, you know, given the information I have right now, um, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a level of comfort of continuing that leadership there. The mayor's message has for more than a year now been our plan will work. Just give it more time. Mm -hmm. And I think she's going to go to voters and say there are some wins here. Yes, there's been some setbacks, mm -hmm. but don't switch captains in the middle of the of the journey like let's keep the ship on the same course uh, how do you overcome that message well look i don't think the ship is going in the right direction i mean the population loss is is absolutely stunning um and you know we're not delivering on the basic city services that our residents want to see so i think that we're seeing overwhelmingly people asking for change and you know that's where i come in with you know what I want to bring to the city of St. Louis is very simple, a focus mm -hmm. on doing the job of a city. To me, that looks like safer neighborhoods, a plan for economic growth, 
and the basics of city services, picking up the trash, filling the potholes, and getting the infrastructure piece right. I, I wonder what the, uh, look, you talk about safety, policing and community policing was a big part of the conversation, the political conversation, especially mm -hmm. in 2021. Does a shrinking city that has a lot fewer people in it today need as many police as it used to have? Well, I'm, I, you know, I mean, that's an excellent question. When we took a look at um, how we police, um, just four years ago, uh, an organization came in and, and did, a, did a pretty complete study, we call it the Teneo Report. Mm -hmm. And that was really a big topic of conversation during the last mayor's race. And what that report really showed is we have a good amount of policing for a city our size. We just need to be a little smarter about how we deploy them, how we organize our police department, and how we coordinate and collaborate with surrounding police departments. And we Work have a, smarter and harder. In, that's in exactly that sense. right. Yeah, and so, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of that report. I think it really outlined a plan of action for the city of St. Louis's police department. And I think that... So do you approve of her cops and clinicians or her 911 diversion programs? I do think that there is some merit behind some of those. You know, our circuit attorney, Gabe Gore has come in and really stepped up the diversion, uh, the diversions, you know, portion of the circuit attorney's office. And I think that there's a lot to be said for you know, for those diversion mm -hmm. programs, if you get folks on the early side of those of criminal activity, um, but you know, you've got to have the right people in those positions and, and staffed up appropriately to make them effective. We know poverty and crime and poverty and violence are closely linked. Mm -hmm. uh, rent and the rate of homelessness are both rising after the pandemic. How would you address that? Homelessness is an enormous challenge and one that's going to have that's going to require real leadership. And by leadership, I mean really coordinating the city services, um, the uh, the uh, private sector, uh, the folks that are delivering homeless services to the citizens of St. Louis. That's not happening right now. We don't have a coordinated approach. It's a rather tense relationship with the mayor's office. It absolutely is a tense relationship, and that needs to be broken down to be effective. You're so, talking about the way the city works with those people that are on the front lines, but there, there's also policy questions here. Uh, there was a progressive pr pr proposal before the Board of Aldermen that would have expanded shelter capacity in some neighborhoods, maybe some neighborhoods that didn't entirely mm -hmm. want it, and it came down to a single vote. Mm -hmm. You could have been the deciding vote. That's right. You bowed out. I did. Why? You know, um, I think that, that the, the proposal before the Board of Aldermen um, is extremely well-intentioned and has a lot of merit. You know, that not only would expand, you kind of talked about it expanding um, the homeless capacity, but for, what, for shelters, not necessarily. what it really did was really sort of um, remove the community engagement piece the, re the required community engagement on the front end of putting a shelter in. And what I have been very strongly supporting is this is an approach that includes community in decision making of where these shelters are going and and i think to um the sponsor has been extremely workable and sort of re-envisioning how that bill and how we're mm -hmm. proposing to put shelters in in neighborhoods uh, include communities rather than kind of well bypass them. let me ask it this way because that's it's called the plat and petition process for any of our viewers that mm -hmm. don't know it you have to get a lot of buy-in from your neighbors before you bring something to town the board of aldermen just approved getting rid of those very same regulations to bring more liquor licenses into town. I was so, also opposed to that, by the way. <laughs> but so. what does it say about the moral direction of the city if um, they can say, we're going to get rid of community buy-in to sell you liquor, but we're not going to get rid of it to put people in shelter? Well, look, I mean, I think anytime you kind of eliminate community engagement, um, it, you have to be very careful when you do that. On the side of the liquor, you know, there was on the liquor uh, uh, licensing piece. I had some strong concerns about that as well, and I brought those that same issue you just talked about mm -hmm. uh, to those conversations. And I think it is important that when you're bringing in bars and restaurants, homeless shelters, you have some community engagement that looks like identifying potential issues and identifying solutions when those potential problems come to fruition. Alderwoman Kara Spencer, I wish we had more time. I'm sure we'll catch up with you. We've also invited Mayor Jones to come on and share her vision for a second term. We'll back, we're back in just a moment. It is election season, and that means it's debate season, or at least we hope. We have invited the campaigns for C Congresswoman Cori Bush and Wesley Bell to debate on KSDK. We hope that they'll join us, if not for a debate, at least for interviews, and we hope to have some answers, perhaps some developments to share with you at this time next week on that front. Also, you can always catch our extended interviews up on our website, ksdk.com, on the Politics tab. You can find our full shows there every week, too. You can leave us a tip or a note. Just text the record 
to 314-425-5355. Always tune in here every Sunday for the latest political news across the bi-state in Illinois, Missouri, and here in St. Louis. That's all of our time this week. We hope to see you right back here at the same time next Sunday. Until then, we're off the record.